Hey, folks, Roland Martin here, broadcasting live from Los Angeles. We're here at the YWCA of Greater Los Angeles, where McDonald's is unveiling their new uh, campaign targeting African Americans. We'll tell you all about it and hear from McDonald's executives. Also, Jesse Smollett continues to dominate the headlines in Chicago. Uh, Kim Fox, the Cook County State's Attorney, is under relentless attacks uh, from police officials, the mayor, and others. Uh, you will hear, for, hear from her, explain herself why they chose chose to drop those charges against Jesse Smollett. A woman is a, uh, who worked with R. Kelly has accused him of sexual assault. Uh, Wait to hear what she has to say. Also, folks, uh, on today's show, uh, we'll tell you about 12 black women who stood up for themselves in Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, is it one hell of a story, uh, and it's one that you likely did not hear about. Uh, also, uh, on today's show, y'all know. I don't know what's up with these crazy ass white men and white white men and white women, but every day that was a new one. And guess what? We now have permit Patty. We gonna explain all this nonsense for you. And also, Donald Trump. What the hell didn't he say that was crazy today? <laughs> it's time to bring the funk. Roland Martin unfiltered. Let's go. All right, folks, Jesse Smollett continues to dominate the headlines, and the person who is under relentless attack is not him. It is Kim Fox. She's the Cook County State's attorney. It was her office that decided to drop the charges against uh, Jesse Smollett to allow him uh, to also uh, get away, essentially, with uh, the $10,000 uh, bond, allow them to keep that. Uh, you have uh, Chicago Mayor Rahm Emanuel. Uh, the city has sent him a $130,000 bill. They say that's the amount of money Chicago police spent on overtime investigating his case. They also claim uh, that they have a legal right to get that money based upon previous cases. And so uh, that's what we are sitting here uh, covering as well. First of all, I'm broadcasting folks from Los Angeles at the YMCA, Greater Los Angeles, where McDonald's is unveiling their uh, new campaign. And so that's where we, we're sitting outside. We're also here, of course, for the NAACP Image Awards. And folks here, of course, are talking about uh, the Justice Smollett case. Uh, Kim uh, Fox, she also, folks, uh, talked talked about uh, what's going on in terms of her being criticized. And this is what she had to say about the criticism of her, her office's decision to drop these charges. Because we have, this is consistent with what we do in alternative prosecution. And I think it's important because I don't think people understand what that is. In the last two years, we've had 5,700 people participate in some form of diversion program because we want to get to just outcomes. It is possible that if we did not offer a diversionary um, outlet for Mr. Smollett, that he could have taken this case to trial. He could have been found um, guilty. He could have very well been found not guilty. We are not the trier of fact. We do bring the charges with the belief that we can prove it, but he could have very well been found not guilty. What diversion allows is even for those who are guilty to be able to get to the same outcome. If he's found guilty on a class four, the likelihood was he was going to get some type of perhaps restitution, community service, not prison. And so if we can get to the same outcomes, if we get to the same measures of justice without going through the court process, we do that. And we've done that historically. 
All right, folks, let's bring in our panel, Midwin Charles. She is, of course, attorney, managing principal, Midwin Charles and Associates, also MSNBC legal analyst. We have Kelly Bethea, communication strategist, and Eugene Craig, CEO, uh, Eugene Craig Organization. All right, so, um, Midwin, I want to start with you. Mm-hmm. Um, do you believe that the Cook County State's Attorney's Office simply did not handle this well? So let me, let me explain that. Uh, you have the Chicago, you have the uh, police uh, union. They're going to have a protest outside of her office on Monday morning. And when you look at this case, now I've covered many cases, and normally what happens, Midwin, is that there's a plea bargain. In exchange to dropping charges, uh, they say that the defendant is going to um, be involved in community service, pay a fine or whatever. Mm-hmm. The way this was announced and done is totally different. Do you think that's why you have this level of criticism because of how this was done two things one you are correct in the sense where oftentimes you will get a defendant to take a plea deal uh, and in some ways either admit guilt to a lower uh, offense or a lower charge Um, but what she is explaining and what you just showed in your video this sort of alternative prosecution happens all the time you know people just aren't aware of it but it does happen all of the time because as she articulated and i think in a very good way is it's a great way to kind of get to the end result Uh, that you would have gotten to had there been a trial, which, by the way, is a lot more expensive, okay? So the city of Chicago uh, would have paid a lot of money to try this case, and there's a chance that Justice Smollett could have been found not guilty as well. Now, what I think people are surprised about is that this is the same district attorney's office that charged him with 16 counts. So how do you go from, oh, my goodness, this is such an extreme case. We have to make an example out of him. We're going to charge him with 16 counts to, okay, all the charges are dropped, he does community service, and he forfeits his $10,000 bail amount. So I think that is the surprise that people are articulating. But what you see coming out of the police department, what you see coming out of Rahm Emanuel is entirely different. They are, from the very beginning that this case began, there has been a sort of, uh, um, uh, 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 impetus to discredit Jesse Smollett. And it began from the very beginning. There was information leaking from the police department, and it was always a, an unnamed source to discredit the claims and to discredit the allegations of Jesse Smollett, which is actually quite bizarre, because when a victim of crime walks into a police department to file a complaint, I mean, I, I've been a victim of crime. I've walked into a police department. I know what it's like. It is not the police department's job to discredit that person. It is their job to investigate the case. The problem with the Chicago PD is that they tried to try this case in the court of public opinion rather than simply right. conduct an investigation. Kelly, I was also um, shocked and stunned to read a piece yesterday where Chicago police put up the two men who they say Jesse Smollett hired uh, to uh, perpetrate this hoax. They put them up in a hotel, put them up in a hotel for six days, provided them around the clock security, went and got food for them, uh, and also took them through a side door uh, when they were going into court. And I'm going, this is not a murder investigation. This is not a sexual assault. Uh, And so it it, it was absolutely strange that the taxpayers of Chicago paid for the hotel rooms of these two men for six days. I wonder if Kim, if the prosecutor in Kim Fox's office said, man, if we go to trial and explain that, what the hell is the jury going to say? I know what I would say on that jury. I would say that he's probably not guilty because it looks like the Chicago Police Department crafted this entire situation to make an example out of somebody who went through such a bizarre experience. Again, because he didn't go to trial, we really don't know what happened, how innocent, how guilty he is, and just on on its face, he went through an assault, and somebody assaulted him. And because we now know that the two alleged assailants are black, now all of a sudden he wasn't assaulted at all in the court of public opinion. So when you Um, when you join that with the fact that the police were doing something quite frankly egregious, 
it still it, it still boggles my mind exactly how crazy this story has gotten. Yet when the state's attorney's office continues to assert that Jussie perpetrated a hoax, that he did this. I mean, th so this is this is still I mean, this is still, again, absolutely confusing. Right. And, but, and I and I, get, I think this is why the mm -hmm. public is sort of like, well, I, I have no idea. It, I mean, how is two plus two nine? Um, <laughs> what's going on here? Because and then you have Jesse who was saying, absolutely, I was assaulted. This did indeed. Ha this indeed happened. Right. But here's the other deal. The, t the, the, uh, the, the two individuals, where in the hell are they? Right. 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 And and, th and that I think that is what is part of what's confusing here is no one really knows what happened to Jesse Smollett except for Jesse Smollett. And chances are we may never know because not only have all the charges been dropped, the record has been sealed. But again, you have we have to remind um, your audience, Roland, that this is typical. These kinds of things happen. And, and, you know, I think it was very good for Kim Fox to give that interview and throw out the number of 5,700 cases. In other words, alternative prosecutions happen all the time. It just so happens right, that this right. case has gotten a lot of attention and a lot of publicity. And, you know, for the police department to say that they diverted resources from very serious crimes in order to deal with this case is perhaps a mistake that they made. I mean, they are the ones who are responsible for determining the severity of a crime, um, how important it is. And if they chose to divert resources from very serious crimes to deal with this matter where there was no victim other than Jesse Smollett himself, allegedly, uh, no one else was hurt, then that's on them. That's a poor decision that they made, and we have to question how it is that they're running this police department. But for Rahm Emanuel and for the Chicago Police you Department, to stand with the puffy chest and act as though they are, you know, the shining example of credibility and truth telling is rich, particularly given what we know about the Laquan McDonald shooting death, how hard Rahm Emanuel worked to keep that tape from ever coming to light. Just a few weeks ago, three of the police officers right. that were involved in that shooting were acquitted of obstruction of justice. So if anyone ought to be talking about telling the truth and how important that is, it is not the Chicago Police Department and it is not Mayor Rahm Emanuel. Eugene, I want to bring you in on this point because this is what's really bothering me. Frankly, it's pissing me off. Pissing me off. Too. Rahm Emanuel was making a big deal out of the expenses uh, <laughs> that were paid, that, that, that expenses that, that were incurred, $130,000. Mm -hmm. In the last 14 years, $712 million. $712 million. Mm -hmm was expended by the city of Chicago taxpayers to settle police misconduct cases. I'm just trying to understand if you're Rahm Emanuel and you're trying to make this argument about, oh, how the city's resources were wasted, and you say nothing about $712 million, please show me the evidence where there is a video of Rahm Emanuel going public to say to Chicago cops, damn it, stop beating people and stop the misconduct but because you're costing us nearly a, a trillion dollars. I haven't heard that at all from Rahm Emanuel, and that to me uh, shows how grossly offensive he is. And in fact, if I sat here and did the math, <laughs> and you took the $130,000, okay, that means that the, if you use, if you took 712 million and the $130,000, that means that there are nearly 5,500 cases like Jesse Smollett that equaled uh, $712 million. And this man is standing here on his high horse mm -hmm. when he has said nothing to the cops. Mm -hmm. He nope. has said nothing to the union. Nope. He has said nothing to the public. Mm -hmm. Nope. I mean, the issue is this, right? You have, uh, well, you have two issues here. You have one, the first, where, you know, of that 14 years, eight of those years were under Rahm Emanuel's uh, uh, tenure, in which, look, you know, and the way Chicago's being run, they're, built, they're, they're spending enough money to build a new football stadium every, you know, decade and a half. That, that's money that they could have actually been used to, be, to put more police on the ground to actually deal with issues that Chicago have. Secondly, um, 
What you see here is what happens when you have an overzealous mayor, you have an overzealous police commissioner that go out and make public statements that they should not make because they miscalculate and think that they make they make the miscalculation uh, that the person that they're vilifying is more is, is 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 more dirty to the public than themselves in the dirt that they have on them. Mm -hmm. That, that, that's what you have here, and they're just doubling down and tripling down. You know, for Rom to make hay over, you know, $130,000 that he now wants to build Jesse Smollett, okay, that's cool. Let's go back and build a police union for the last, for, for, for the $714, $715 million that they've ended up, that the city's had to shout out on their behalf. They got it. It's right there in the pension. You can have them pay for it, you know, so, you know, but... Bruh. But the, but Rom doesn't have that outrage. I think it's offensive to, to the city of Chicago. I think he's an embarrassment yes. and offensive to the city of Chicago. I think he's an embarrassment and offensive to the black community. And I think, you know, I'll take it a step further. I think he's, it's more so offensive that he's dealt with these issues up close and personal as Barack Obama's former chief of staff. That's how he rode into the mayorship of Chicago, as Barack Obama's former chief of staff. Right. As a former... Well, here's the other deal. Here's the other deal. Show me... But, but wait a minute here. Show me, and again, uh, uh, um, uh, 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 Kelly and, and Mitt, when uh, you can chime in on this here, mm -hmm. you just had a, 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 a story where the cops busted up a birthday party of a four-year-old black girl, mm -hmm. tore the place up, and it was the wrong house. Yeah. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Has Rahm Emanuel publicly apologized for that? Not a word. Not at all. Not a word. And you're not going to get that apology mm -hmm. because it doesn't matter. What matters is the fact that Jesse Smollett is a celebrity. Jesse Smollett, by way of the Empire brand, brought money into the city. And now that's a tarnish on the city, the fact that this celebrity did something that is allegedly egregious. Again, we don't know what happened. For all we know, he really was assaulted. And frankly, because that's the only straight story that we have so far because Jesse has not deviated from his story whatsoever. It's the police department. It's been the state's attorney's department. It's literally been every single person other than Jesse Smollett who has deviated from the story as to what happened to Jesse Smollett. So that that's just how egregious this entire thing is. But you know, Roland, can I, if I could jump in real quick, I think one, I think one of the fault here is that it's the local media, national media that's been descending on Chicago needs to put the, the other stories in front of the mayor and the police superintendent. You know, the, they, they, you know, that's for, right. And, and that's force, right. And force and Rom to, 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 to issue an apology mm -hmm. to what happened to that four year old's birthday party. That's right. Force Rom to issue an apology for, you know, Look to a large McDonald's. degree himself obstructing justice mm -hmm. um, with trying to bury the video of Laquan McDonald. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, it's you know, you know, the, one one of the things that you know, the, when the police commissioner held his presser about the situation and chided the media about their coverage of how they all descended because of this case, and you know, where are they when you know they have the other 300, 400 murders in Chicago. Right. I'm like, hey, you know what? Give him that coverage. Go, yeah, go get in his face and ask him about these other cases. Mm -hmm. Put him on the record. But but also, Roland. That's right. Also, Roland, what I think is... Last, com last comment before I go to my next story. Last comment, Okay, I just want to say also what's important here is is when you look at this in a larger context, you see a narrative that, that's start starting to sort of push forward, which is that a black gay man, which is what Jesse Smollett uh -huh. was, which it's important not to forget that. He is a celebrity. He is rich. He can afford to forfeit a $10,000 bail. A lot of people can't. But the, you see this narrative developing that a black man, a black gay man cannot be a victim of crime and that a black gay man cannot be the victim of a hate crime. And you see this narrative starting to sort of be pushed forward um, from a lot of people. And it's really dangerous. You know, hate crimes happen Got a it. lot. They've been on the rise, particularly since Donald Trump was elected president. Mm -hmm. And that's something that we cannot walk away from. And while this may or may not have happened, it doesn't mean that hate crimes are not on the rise and that black people, Jewish people, Muslims have not been victims of hate crimes. Got it. All right, folks, let's go to the second story. Another woman has come forward to describe a sexual assault by R. Kelly. This time it's Lanita Carter, who claims that uh, she was his hair braider for a year uh, back in 2003. Of course, Kelly has been charged with 10 counts of felony aggravated sexual abuse uh, charges uh, involving four women. Now, Carter is one of those women. Now, folks, if you what you hear what she's going to say, she's going to describe what happened a day in 2003. It, the details are extremely explicit. And here's what she had to say about R. Kelly. He had never propositioned you or asked you to do anything sexual before, but then this particular day, 
What happened? February 18, 2003, I get a phone call to come down and do his hair. When he came to the room and he asked me for that head massage, and I told him I didn't do massages, I laughed it off. And I didn't know he was for real. If I could change that day, I wouldn't have been there. He pulled my, my, my braid down by him, and he said, suck it for daddy, suck it for daddy. And I said, no, and I did like this. And he just started going <laughs> He did like six, six times. Carter says Kelly stopped only after someone knocked on the door. He didn't open the door right away. He said, fix your face. Fix your motherfucking face. I knew that would be my last day there. And I get to the bathroom, I grab the wall, and it was a rose-colored towel. And I wipe my face. I'm not dressed no type of way. I look at myself in the mirror like, I don't, I'm not a beauty queen. I didn't perceive myself to be nothing more than just his hair braider. And I was kept thinking to myself, like, why did this happen to me? You called the police the day that this happened? The exact day. They asked for my clothing. And I gave them my favorite Tommy Hilfiger shirt. And that's where they found DNA evidence. DNA evidence from R. Kelly on your shirt. Same man. And even with all of that, no charges were filed against R. Kelly. Uh, Lanita Carter made two settlements with R. Kelly, totaling uh, uh, three quarters of a million dollars. In those settlements, R. Kelly admitted no wrongdoing. Carter also agreed to keep quiet, but it wasn't until she saw R. Kelly in his interview with Gail King that she chose to actually break her non-disclosure agreement and to come forward. I'll start with you, Mitwin. Uh, her coming forward, obviously, in giving this interview, she's four, she's one of the four women uh, who prosecutors have actually charged R. Kelly uh, with uh, assault. Mm -hmm. um, was it, from a legal standpoint, was it smart for her to give an interview even though uh, the charges have been filed mm -hmm. and this is going to uh, potentially go to trial? Right. And also, it appears as though she's breached her non-disclosure agreement. I mean, I haven't read it. I don't know what the terms are. Um, but it, I think it's interesting that she chose to give this interview only because she is a victim. She claims to be a, vic a victim. And it's always important for people to see victims firsthand and to sort of try to assess their credibility. I know from watching the tape, I found her to be very credible um, with her description of what happened. She was very detailed. Uh, she remembers exactly what she was sent there to do, what she was wearing. She called the police right away. Those are the kind of things that you tend to look to when you want to determine and whether someone is credible. Um, but when you have a case that's proceeding, usually you want the victim to not necessarily go public. But here in this case, I think it may work to her advantage because she does come across as very credible. Uh, Kelly, obviously, when you look at these cases like this, uh, R. Kelly is out obviously trying to tell his side of the story for her to come forward and break the non-disclosure non agreement. Uh, she did so with the media. Now, had she testified in court, then uh, she uh, would not, uh, that would not be uh, placed in jeopardy. Uh, and so if R. Kelly chooses to go after her, he, uh, him and his lawyers could very well do so to try to reclaim uh, some of that money. That's entirely possible, but at the same time, her story's out there, and it might even bring out more people who have been assaulted by R. Kelly. Not that we need any more people who have allegedly been assaulted by R. Kelly, because this has been going on for about two decades plus now. I just need to know what it's going to take to actually prosecute this man, convict this man, and send him on his way to jail. Because that, frankly, is where he belongs. We have way too many stories about him that are credible. We have way too much proof through his songs, through testimony, through interviews, both from the victims and R. Kelly himself. I don't know what's, what it's going to take for black women to be believed, but it needs to happen soon. 
Eugene, I want to ask you about this story. Uh, former Nevada State Assemblywoman Lucy Flores uh, wrote a piece in The Cut where she said uh, that uh, that Joe Biden put her in an extremely awkward and uncomfortable in, uh, position in 2014. She was running for governor, lieutenant governor at that time, uh, and they won a campaign event, and she said that Biden came up, touched her shoulders, and then inhaled her hair and kissed her on the back of her head. She said, uh, I thought to myself, I didn't wash my hair today, and the vice president of the United States is smelling it. And also, uh, what in the actual fuck? Why is the vice president of the United States smelling my hair? He proceeded to plant a big slow kiss on the back of my head. My brain couldn't process what was happening. I was embarrassed. I was shocked. I was confused. Uh, and then she said that the greatest thing for her was her name was called so she can get on stage and get away from him. And she said his behavior was, quote, blatantly inappropriate and unnerving and made her feel uneasy, gross, and confused. Now, other folks have also uh, talked about how uh, Joe Biden, how he... Uh, how he uh, is touchy feely. Mm -hmm. There's video people have put out there oh, yeah. as well. Uh, and um, th now the Biden folks did put a statement out where they said the Biden was pleased to support her at the time. He said, neither then nor in the years since did he or the staff with him at the time have an inkling that Ms. Flores has been at any time uncomfortable, nor do they recall what she describes. But Vice President Biden believes that Ms. Flores has every right to share her own recollection and reflections and that it is a change for better in our society that she has the opportunity to do so. He respects Ms. Flores as a strong and independent voice in our politics and wishes her only the best. Now, obviously, Joe Biden isn't even in the presidential race. Uh, so what do you make of this uh, Nevada, former, former politician in Nevada, coming forward with this statement five years after the fact regarding Joe Biden? You know, I, it's interesting. Uh, it's a lot of different angles here. First and foremost, you know, Joe is in the race, but don't be shocked if you start seeing a lot of the uh, oppo research start trickling out there, right? Um, you know, I think she has a right to tell her story uh, you know, as she recollects it. Um, you know, there is more than ample enough uh, photo, video, <laughs> documented uh, visuals of what some have deemed to be creepy Uncle Joe, um, of him, you know, doing this exact same thing of uh, the whole, you know, hands on the shoulders and that type of, you know, stuff. Um, but, you know, but, it's, but, it's, but it's, here's it's, a piece that... It's, you no, know, go ahead, finish. Go ahead, finish. But, but, but you know, he's not in the race. Um, you know, he's not in the race yet. And, but it, it is a reflection of the change of the times. I mean, even just you know, five years ago, back in 2014, I don't think you know we would be having this conversation. Uh -uh. But here's the key issue, Kelly and Mitwin. Um, you have the number of women, Democratic women, who are in the race. Mm -hmm. But then you're also running against Donald Trump, uh, a man who look. Access Hollywood video certainly had no bearing on 53% of white women voting for Donald Trump. The question is, is this disqualifying for Joe Biden? Kelly first, then uh, Mitwin. Is it disqualifying officially, technically speaking? I don't think so. But in this era of the Me Too movement, it's definitely damaging. Um, I think the reason why Trump won wasn't because of the video regarding what he said to, I believe, Billy Bush at the time. I think it had a lot to do with, you know, who his uh, future constituents were, and they really wanted him in the White House. The Democrats, on the other hand, don't necessarily tolerate that as much as, say, uh, the Trump administration and the people therein. Um, regarding Biden himself, it, it's very tricky. Again, like Gene said, He's not officially in the race, but it's always been a nodge, nodge, wink, wink for the past couple months regarding whether he's going to run. So when he, you know, maybe officially runs, this definitely is something that could come back to bite him. You know, um, Joe Biden has been polling the highest um, of all the Democrats that say they're going to run and that have officially declared their candidacy. Um, this could potentially be damaging for Joe Biden, particularly when you take it in context with how he treated Anita Hill during the Clarence Thomas um, um, 
uh, hearings. He was the chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee at the time, so he was the one who essentially could have given her a fair hearing. He's the one that had control, and he admits almost recently in a talk that he didn't treat her fairly and he wished, quote unquote, he could have given her the hearing that she deserved. Now, in order for Joe Biden to get that Democratic nomination, should he decide to run, because he says he hasn't run, he's not, hasn't declared yet, but he's we know run. he probably will. He has to get the vote of black women. And we know that black women are the ones who vote the most. They're the ones who are the most consistent when it comes to voting. So when you couple this most recent claim or allegation with how he treated Anita Hill, who's a black woman, I don't know how that will fare for him um, uh, in trying to get that nomination. So it could be damaging. Well, I think it's going to be very interesting to see how Democratic voters feel about this here, because here's the other piece. Democratic voters, the one thing they absolutely want, they want to get rid of Donald Trump. Trump right. All right, folks, uh, our next story is pretty interesting. We're going to talk about um, uh, uh, this amazing story out of Charleston that you might not know about. All right, folks. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, I, I lost my audio there just for a second. Uh, Fifty years ago today, uh, nurses' aides, mostly African Americans, went on strike against hospitals in Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, they struck for higher wages and better working conditions. The Southern Christian Leadership Conference, led by Ralph Abernathy, uh, saw it as a continuation of SCLC's commitment to labor organizing after the Memphis sanitation strike uh, that took place the previous year. And, of course, Memphis was where Dr. King was assassinated. It all started when 12 courageous black women working as nurses' aides at the uh, Medical College of South Carolina demanded to speak with the president of the hospital about racism and working conditions. One of those 12 women, Mrs. Lu Louise Brown, told her story at a commemoration of the strike at Howard University today, and our Roller Martin Unfiltered cameras were there. To be a nurse in Charleston is like being a slave. And if you got a nurse that said that you didn't do what you're supposed to do, she could have been 16, you would have been terminated. So we got tired of that. So this particular day, we went down, we'd always meet with the vice president. And this particular day, we went down to his office. And when we walked in his office, the secretary was right, she ran out. Twelve black women's coming in. We said, you don't have to run. We come here to see Dr. McCoy. So the vice president, we said, no, we do not want to speak with you. So we stayed in his office. That was our lunch break. We went down on our lunch hours. Our patient was taken care of. So when we went back to our floor to work, we work all day. And at the closing of the day, our director of nursing, which was Louise Bernie, she called us downstairs and she said, I want y'all to come in one by one and speak with you. We said, no, you have to speak to all 12 of us at the same time. So she said, "Black, you're fired. We said, with pleasure. Wow. So we walked out, that was fine. But, and I'll get to some more, but as a black nurse in Charleston in 69, it was horrible in the hospital. So that's how the hospital strike began. We were devastated. We were determined that we were not going to be bossed around. Well, eventually 400 women went on strike against the two hospitals and their white administrators. The government declared a citywide emergency and called out the National Guard and sent in hundreds of state police to the city. A thousand people were arrested and a month-long curfew was put into effect. The strike officially ended in June 1969 when hospital leadership finally agreed to meet some of the workers' demands. The strike ended with some of the workers' demands met. Of course, this is Women's History Month, and so we certainly uh, appreciate what those sisters did. And that's a story that, frankly, many of us simply had never heard about. We knew about the Memphis Sanitation Workers' Strike, but not that particular strike. All right, folks, let's talk about, uh, Lord, the people at Fox and Friends, y'all. So uh, um, how many of you have seen this video of this uh, young man in his car? And he was uh, stopped by the folks with ICE. And he made it perfectly clear that uh, he knew his rights 
and knew what that they were trying to present him a warrant simply did not fly. Um, roll that video, y'all. We have the video, correct? Rights training to stop ICE from making an arrest. Brian McCormick was pulled over in New York earlier this month with two illegal immigrants in his car. That's when an ICE agent tried to open the door. Those are not warrants of arrest, sir. Yes, they are, sir. Warrant of arrest of alien. Yeah, warrant of arrest of alien. Alien not signed by a judge. It's not a judicial warrant. It's a warrant under the Immigration and Nationality Act of the United States. Okay, that's fine, but it's not under the Constitution. You have no jurisdiction over me as a citizen. I'm the driver of this vehicle. I says people who interfere with officers' jobs are putting people at risk. Let's look at your headlines. Send it to you. And so, uh, look at that. Yeah, they're learning the right, their rights, and wh that's unbelievable. All right. Okay, really? Really? Really, Mitwin? The people at Fox and Friends are complaining that a guy knows his constitutional rights? Oh, I thought they were strict constructionists over there. They were all about the law and knowing the rule of law. Well, I think what you see here is is this narrative that um, some people have rights and others don't. And you also see oftentimes a narrative that one person's rights should supersede another's rights, right? Like you see it with some people who make arguments in favor of the Second Amendment or other such arguments. You know, they have the right to bear arms, but, but that right to bear arms doesn't supersede my right to live, right? I mean, we all have rights in this country, and supposedly those rights ought to be equal. Equal. Now, we know from historically and even till today that that isn't the case, and we are working towards a more perfect union in this country. But, but the audacity for a comment like that to be made, in other words, that it's appalling that this person knew what his rights were and that he exercised them, is astounding, particularly since that network spends a lot of time talking about how people have rights and rights to do this and rights to do that and rights to do right. this. So it's, it's the irony is rich. I, I, I just thought I, I just thought it was quite funny, Kelly, to see them whining, complaining, because the guy actually knew his constitutional rights, as opposed to praising them for doing so. Right. But again, that's what you also can expect. I got to ask you this, Kelly and Eugene. Of course, you know Donald Trump. He loves Fox News, and so apparently he is hiring another one of their contributors, Morgan Ortegas, to be the new State Department spokesperson, uh, the previous spokesperson uh, who he had nominated to be the next United Nations ambassador, but she had to withdraw because, uh, let's say, she had some nanny gate issues. Uh, so it's crazy, Kelly, that literally, uh, if you, if that, that Fox News uh, might as well move into the Lincoln bedroom uh, because uh, they are in, lock, in, in lock st lockstep with everything Donald Trump does. I mean, this they complained about uh, Rachel Maddow and others being close to the Obama administration. We have seen nothing like this before. I, and you probably won't see anything like this again. I find it ironic that Fox News almost gives Trump legitimacy in that he by way of his tweets, by way of how he even talks, his syntax, all of that, it's clear that he doesn't know the law himself. And Fox News is the one who kind of feeds him what the law is. I also or find what it, they claim the law or what be. they claim the law to be, which is eight times out of ten wrong <laughs> anyway. So the fact I find that ironic. I also find ironic, again, going back to the clip, that you don't want us to act like sheep in that you want us to act like you, we know the law all the time or we don't know the law and you are the ones who are supposed to tell us what the law is. But once we actually learn what the law is, that's when you, you know, just kind of recoil and be like, how dare you? And it's like, these are the laws that were meant to protect me. Eugene, no Fox News person in the future better say a word if a Democratic president gets in there and they even have one conversation uh, with a television show host at another network. Oh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't want to ever hear the words constitutional conservative come out of the Fox News network ever again. So apparently, you know, <laughs> they've thrown the constitutional part of that freeze out the window with this last segment. Um, but the thing is this, uh, you know, Fox News and uh, Trump are joined at the hip. You know, Donald Trump's communication team on the official side is run by Mercedes Slap, who husband is who? Matt Slap, who's the head of the ACU, who, you know, pretty much, you know, gives a, you know, platform, you know, Fox gives an unfettered platform to. 
Uh, his unofficial communications team is Sean Hannity and Tucker Carlson. Mm -hmm. I mean, he literally hired Bill Shine, who was the, you know, the, essentially the executive director over at Fox. So, I mean, the thing is, dude, this. they call Lou, they call Lou Dobbs and Peter Hexeth during meetings to get them well, to weigh well, in on public policy. Well, 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 the, Roland, let's take it a step further. Stephen Moore is now his new nominee for the Federal Reserve Board. I mean, Stephen Moore made his name as a Fox talking head on, on issues of, you know, he's pretty much, you know, the, the Art Laughter's first Doc son. Doc is crazy. <laughs> now, you, you know, the, the, conflicts, it's crazy. Yeah. And the conflicts of interest in all of this is, is galling. I mean, it, it's appalling on many levels. But what's, what I find to be the saddest part in all of this is that this administration has nominated people to work in it that are wholly incompetent. They lack the skills. They lack the education. They lack the experience to do the job. And we see that with Betsy Davos. We see it with so many people in this administration. Right. And it hurts the country at the end of the day. So it's not just the fact that you have the president of the United States in bed with the television network, which I think if Barack Obama were chilling with, uh, you know, Rachel Maddow, Right. And and you know uh, Chris Hayes over at MSNBC, you know the right would have a heart attack. But it's also the fact that he yep. is appointing people to these positions that have no idea what they're doing. They don't have a clue, and we as the American people will suffer as a result. Well, speaking of not having a clue, a more crazy ass white people. No charcoal girls are allowed. I'm not white. I got you. Huh? So apparently this woman parked a little too long in a permit only spot at the University of Connecticut and a new permit patty lost her damn mind. I called the cops on me because I'm parking here for two minutes. She just pulled up and now she's gonna call the cops on me because I've been parked here after I just dropped my friend off to class. So yes, please, please take a picture of my license plate because I'm not getting a ticket. I'm not getting a ticket. Nothing's happening to me. You're just harassing me for no reason. You're just harassing me. Please take a picture. Did you take a picture? Stop being so rude. You came up to my car banging on my window with your key. Do you work in family studies? Do you? I'm confused. What's your name? Do you even work here? This is really ridiculous. Why am I being harassed right now? You just pulled up. Get out of my way. This is my car. This is my car. You have no right to be harassed. That's my car. Okay. And I have a parking. That's great. Permit. That's great. That you, see I all these you see all these classes. You see all these parking spots? Do not touch me. Do not touch me. Do not touch get me. Get away. Do from not me. touch me. You get away from me. This is really crazy. This is really hilarious. I'm so glad I have this on film. I'm so glad I have this on film. Why I'm behaving like this when you came up to me, harassing me about where I'm parking. There are plenty of parking spots. And I have been here for no more than five minutes, but you just got here. You just got here, so why are you harassing me? Please don't get close to me. Do not. Please back up. Back up from my car. Back up from my car, please. Please get this woman. No, I'm not okay. I'm not okay. I don't know why you're trying to seek, seek some... I'm not okay. She's harassing me. She's harassing me and, uh, and trying to call the cops. Please, please listen to what she's saying. Please listen. She's saying I can't park here. So she's literally banging on my window, harassing me, telling me to get out of my car. And she's not moving until she comes. Call parking services. Like what? Stop harassing me. Yes, yes, exactly. Like what? Law, I, 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 I'm, I keep, Eugene, I'm telling you, if, if one of these white folks roll up on me like this, it's going to be a problem. Um, listen, man. Seriously, listen. the person's parked in the parking spot for 20 but, minutes, but, listen, and the white woman rolls up and calls I, the cops. I, I, may, I may have to pull Elizabeth Warren and claim Native American heritage <laughs> and tell him I am of the Slab of Whole Tribe.
<laughs> it's, wow. Probably, it's going to happen one of these days. Like, they're going to pull up on somebody and they're going to, like, slightly tap them, put their hands on them, and they're going to slap. Yeah. Knock, knocked out. Yeah, you know? I, like, I, yeah I, like, I like to say, don't let your president get you hurt. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, what? but what you see happening in that video is uh, something that we've seen a lot of recently with all the videos. Thank goodness, right? Thank goodness this woman had this on video. But there, there's this sort of entitlement, this sort of sense of white people policing black bodies and, and the certain spaces that yep. black bodies Absolutely. need to be in. And mm -hmm. you saw how this woman clearly was the aggressor, right? She came up to her. She says she banged on the window with her key, which, as, as you know, uh, Kelly pointed out, is assault. Uh, and also vandalizing, right? If you key someone's car, that's, that's vandalizing. And then you notice, as soon as that person came over, she walked over to that person and almost tried to appear as though she was the victim, though that the white woman was the victim. And you see that happening a lot, this sort of idea that black people can't be victims, that black people can't can't be assaulted. Mm -hmm. You see it with the Jesse Smollett case. Mm -hmm. And what I find interesting is when you see a lot of these white people calling police and making these false claims, are they now going to be charged with the cost that it takes for the police to come out? Who's calling for that to happen? Nope. You don't. You, so you see what I'm saying? So nope. there are a lot of hoaxes and a lot of fake calls to 911 and to the police. And it's at some point, these people need to start facing ramifications and consequences. They need to be arrested and they need to pay rest institution for the time and energy that uh, police agree. or law enforcement come out to deal with this. Uh, all right. I go to a break right now, folks. I'll be back in just a second. I'm Roland Martin Unfiltered, broadcasting live from Los Angeles. Whatever we believe about ourselves and our ability comes true for us. Journalist Susan L. Taylor. Our HBCU Giving Day School today is Shelton State Community College, founded in 1994, located in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Our notable graduates include Deontay Wilder, Trey McNutt, and Travis Daniels. If you want to support Shelton State, go to sheltonstate.edu. That's sheltonstate.edu. Our folks calling all HBCU alumni, students, and leaders enter the Ford Motor Company HBCU Mobility Challenge, and you can win up to $25,000 for your school, building on their long-term support. Of HBCUs for looking to improve the mobility in HBCU communities through innovative solutions. The winning program will get a grant of up to $25,000 to implement uh, their innovative solutions uh, for mobility. Now, again, the deadline is in two days, folks. It's in two days. So I want you to go to fgb.life, fgb.life, for more information and to apply. Remember, Ford goes further in our community, and we certainly appreciate them being a partner with us here at Roland Martin unfiltered. All right, folks, we're uh, going to go to a break right now. We come back. We're going to talk about uh, McDonald's new campaign uh, targeting African Americans. I'll explain it all when we come back in just a moment on Roland Martin Unfiltered. You either going to help run it or they're going to run it for you. In order to get anything done in this world, we have to work with the system that's there. And you have to have the courage of your convictions. You may despise me. You may not understand my choice. But at least you can respect that I stood in it. If you are outside the mainstream, no one can push you aside any further. Life makes you jaded and it hurts you and it's painful. And we've had a lot of pain in this country. Trump can show up and say anything and they can just go, oh yeah. And the African American community was great to us. They didn't vote. You know, he just called you stupid. Did you hear that? Oh, uh, oh, uh, oh, uh, but he's for us. Really? And they were just regurgitating the things that they had heard on a radio or in the barbershop or something that somebody had told them. They hadn't thought about it. Democracy is uh, in danger is because people don't know how to think. I'm done with trying to convince people to try to vote for their, you know, for their for their life. You have to run for your life. I'm gonna go try to get people who are open to it and and, and lead them. I'm done with hope. Fuck hope. Fight. That's it.
So, folks, that, that uh, interview with Erica Alexander is going to be airing right after we do this show. So it's going to be at 7, 10 uh, p.m. Eastern. So you definitely want to uh, check that out. Now, of course, we're here in Los Angeles uh, for the NAACP Image Awards, the 50th NAACP Image Awards. But also, that's taking place tomorrow. The pre-show is tonight. We're going to be broadcasting live uh, from the red carpet there uh, in a couple of hours. But right now, we're at the YWCA of Greater Los Angeles, uh, where McDonald's today unveiled... Uh, uh, their new campaign uh, that is specific to African Americans. Joining me right now is uh, Lizette Williams. She has, first of all, she has what I call one of those uh, two sided uh, business card titles. <laughs> She's the head of cultural experiences and engagement for McDonald's. And so glad to have you here. Thank you. It's an honor. So, uh, first of all, um, so explain uh, for the last, what, 15 years, it was 365 Black. Yep. And so now you decided to launch Black and Positively Golden. Yeah. Uh, why the switch? Why the change? You know, it's interesting. McDonald's has been in the fabric. She's going to hold this up for a little bit. In here. the fabric of the African American community for 50 years now. And 365 Black was an amazing campaign. It allowed us to engage the African American audience, to talk to them in a way that's relevant. But that consumer has changed. And it's evolved. And the way that we as a brand wanted to engage with them and elevate and ignite a different type of conversation was critically important. So as the consumer changed, we had to change in order to remain relevant to the audience. And so we thought, let's let's do a refresh and let's launch something that really speaks to them in a powerful way. And of course, you're doing this uh, with Burrell, African American uh, uh, ad agency. And uh, so one of the things that again you 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 wanted to have uh, positively in this slogan, why? You know. McDonald's is a brand that's always been about positivity and feel-good moments. But more than anything, those feel-good moments within the African-American community, I talked a little bit about how McDonald's restaurants were some of the first restaurants in neighborhoods where other brands refused to go into. We've always been a part of those positive memories of positive storytelling. Mm -hmm. And we also wanted to shine a brilliant, positive light on the African-American experience in the United States to enable our platform to ignite that conversation around positivity. Uh, what was the role the uh, black McDonald's owner operators played in this? The black McDonald's owner operators like basically co-created this alongside us. You think about how important they are. There are more than 300 black owner operators in our system right now and more than 1,500 African-American restaurants. They were a critical part in the development and the curation of the campaign. Uh, and uh, you've established uh, a We Are Golden um, um, uh, 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 account there on Instagram. Uh, and so what will this campaign entail in terms of how expansive will it be? You know, the campaign is going to cut across every channel. You'll see us on TV, radio, print, social, digital. Um, but at We Are Golden really exists to support our three strategic messaging pillars. The first one is really focused on empowerment and highlighting empowered experiences that are happening in the African-American community. The second is around ed education, and we continue to support funding HBCU scholarships through the Thurgood Marshall College Fund. And the last one is about entrepreneurship. We just expanded our YWCA program with the Women's Empowerment 360 program that they have to continue to enable and support black female entrepreneurs. Uh, and so, and so you, for, uh, on the broadcast tomorrow night, uh, Image Awards, you're actually debuting uh, the uh, campaign. We are debuting. It is the first time the American public will see the 60-second ad that is all about being black and positively golden. And it was intentional to use and leverage the NAACP Image Awards to, to debut our commercial. All right, then. Well, we certainly appreciate it. Uh, glad to be here as well uh, as you are uh, launching this campaign. And so uh, look forward to the various initiatives uh, all across the community. I, of course, I previously keynoted the Black Madonna mm -hmm. Operators, mm -hmm. uh, their, their, their uh, national convention. And so uh, know a number of them quite well. Great. Thank All you. All right. Thanks so much. Absolutely. I appreciate it. The folks, folks right now, we're actually about to bring in uh, one of those owner operators. And so uh, let's see. Uh, where is she? Let's, let's grab her. Go ahead. Let's, let's go ahead and grab her. Uh, and so uh, I'll go ahead and grab that. Thank and you. so I uh, appreciate it. Thanks a bunch. And so, again, folks, uh, we are here uh, at the YWCA uh, of Los Angeles. Don't worry about it, folks. So we're going to go ahead and get the other guest. Uh, you heard Lizette talk about uh, the owners. She heard her talk about how important uh, they are. You talk about the ability to be able to create wealth as well. 
uh, and uh, you have now multi-generation of black owner and operators. And so we're about to talk to one uh, right now. Uh, of course, her name is Nicole. I uh, says Ineru. 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 Okay, yes. so they didn't give me a phonetic spelling. So Ineru, right. uh, second generation McDonald's uh, owner operator. Uh, based where? Based here in L.A. So I work with my mom and my sister. We're in Compton, Linwood, um, Inglewood. So L.A. How many stores? 18 restaurants. 18, 18 McDonald's uh, uh, franchises. 18 now, restaurants. Now, a lot of people don't actually understand this. First of all, if you saw the movie Founder uh, about uh, Ray Kroc, uh, McDonald's, frankly, is a real estate company. So, the, But the reality is the, the, the corporation doesn't actually own. So what? Franchisees own, what, is it 90% of all restaurants? That's correct. 90% of all restaurants are owned by small business people like our family, um, individually owned franchisees. So um, where, where did it start? Where, where was your, the first uh, restaurant? Our first restaurant was in Los Angeles. It no longer exists on La Cienega in Washington, if you're familiar with L.A. Um, oh, when did it open? 1984. Got it. Uh, my parents were married at the time. Um, they opened another restaurant on La Brea in Rodeo, which um, was actually um, kind of in the middle of the whole Rodney King riot situation that was going on in the 90s. My, my mom owned that restaurant. But when my parents got divorced, my mom actually bought my dad out, which was kind of revolutionary at the time for a single black female to buy out and become an independent owner-operator. So she... Um, Continued to grow the business. Um, I have a sister. We were both went through school, went to college, had other careers, and then decided to come back in the business and work with her in 2003. And so we have grown the business now to 18 restaurants. Now, the other thing that people don't understand, when you're an owner-operator, you have to work the store. Oh, yes. Yes. Well, first of all, as part of the um, second generation program, you're required to go through all the steps. So I worked from doing fries to sweeping the floors. Um, it's funny. I was actually in the restaurant this morning because I went to one of my restaurants this morning and I was telling um, the people there like, OK, if you guys want me to work, I can come in there and work. You know, my mom always told us, number one, you can't ask somebody else to do a job that you're not willing to do and they haven't seen you do. And um, number Number two, you can never let people hold you captive. If they know you can come in there and open that store and do what you need to do, then they know they better do what they need to do. Now, the other thing that people uh, also, again, don't know, I mean, I, I've known so many different owner and operators, uh, it's sort of also like in, in, in the car industry. That is, just because your daddy owned or your mama owned uh, the dealership, it doesn't mean it, it can just be naturally passed down to you. You have to actually go through, essentially, uh, a proving ground to prove that you can run a store. Absolutely. And actually, um, so as a second generation um, owner operator, you go through a process and you become approved. And it's a pretty stringent process. You can become an owner operator just off the street. It's through the registered applicant program and some people actually say it's harder if, as a next gen because McDonald's wants to make sure that you understand you're taking on this responsibility not just because your parents did it you're entitled to get those restaurants and so when you talk about those 300 plus African Americans across the country who are uh, franchisees um, it, it really does. I mean, again, it's it's a business. It, I mean, it is it is it is a business that you're responsible for. Uh, and even though you have this large corporation uh, with uh, their branding, their muscle behind it, you still you still have to actually work it. So, how do y'all within the community uh, let folks know and understand that when you go to these McDonald's, you're actually supporting a black-owned business? So, uh, somebody might think of a black-owned restaurant, might think of just a soul food restaurant, but the reality right. is. Your 18 McDonald's are black-owned restaurants. Correct. Well, first of all, it's about being in the restaurants, like you said, talking to customers, letting people know, going out to events. I speak at a lot of different events, and inevitably I get a comment or a question, oh, we didn't even know black people own McDonald's. We didn't even know black people own businesses. So it's really about— So when you're about in a restaurant, do you have a, you have a shirt that says owner? No, but <clears throat> it's very funny. People figure it out real quick. I guess maybe I look different or what, but they're like, oh, what are you, a supervisor? And I say, um, yeah, something like that. And then, you know, we get into a conversation. But people figure it out pretty pretty quickly. Uh, let's talk about, of course, uh, this particular campaign here for, uh, again, uh, nearly two dec dec decades, or 365 Black. 
a lot of people listen, of course, that's on the Tom Jordan Morning Show, uh, hear, often hear us referring to that. But now when you talk about black and positively golden, what, what do you hope this campaign does for African Americans? I really hope that it helps Af African Americans to realize the importance of um, community to McDonald's as a brand, to us as individual franchisees, and how we really honor and respect all of the positive things that are going on in our communities, and that, you know, we just want to highlight that and say thank you. Well, I got to ask this last question because we're almost out of time. Okay. So what happens when you're on the road or you are going through an airport and you are hungry and it's a Wendy's and a Burger King? Well, <laughs> probably what's going to happen is I'll be eating on the plane. <laughs> so you're going to go get some Pringles uh, and just give me some nuts and I'm yeah. good. So, yeah, so you, I'm good. So you, you won't go to one of those restaurants? Um, I probably would just eat on the plane. I think that's the best idea. Or you know what? Talk to the airport. Maybe we could get a McDonald's in the airport. How about that? <laughs> All right, then. I certainly appreciate it, Nicole. Thanks a lot. Thank you. All right, good, folks. Uh, again, you're going to see the commercial debut tomorrow uh, during the NAACP Image Awards, uh, of course, broadcast on TV One. Uh, the 50th anniversary, they've already announced that uh, uh, Tom Joyner is going to be also recognized uh, for Lifetime Achievement. Also, Jay-Z is going to get the President's Award as well. Derek Johnson, he announced that on social media uh, on last uh, on this morning. And so uh, we'll, our camera's going to be there. We'll be on the red carpet uh, this evening for the NAACP uh, pre-awards uh, show. So we're going to actually literally be in the show right now, pack up, and head on over there. Uh, right after we end this show, of course, you're going to be able to see our interview, of course, with Erica Alexander, of course, many of you know from Living Single, also Black Lightning, talking about power, talking about issues, talking about being involved in the political process. So you don't want to miss that. It's going to be coming up right after we finish this show. Uh, let me thank Kelly, Mitwin, and you Gene for also being my panel today back at the studio in Washington, D.C. We certainly appreciate folks at McDonald's bringing us out here and being a part of the launch of Black and Positively Golden. Uh, in fact, uh, Henry, go ahead and uh, where's my backpack? So uh, grab it. So they made these shirts. Uh, and so look inside this backpack right here, Sheila. Uh, uh, the, uh, so I'm going to show this real quick. And so I'm, gonna, I'm probably going to wear one of them uh, on the air uh, next week. So let me see here. I had to get, so I had to get these made and so there are about 10 different names you could pick it was like glowing inspirational what they what they should have had was they should have had one that said alpha okay so the colors are black and gold that's what they should have had so here's one of the t-shirts right here and of course you know i had to get mine to say legendary y'all know i had to do what i had to do and i got a second one that says bold but uh, we're going to rock both of them. So uh, we appreciate being here. Again, the YWCA, Greater Los Angeles. If you're in Los Angeles from 6 to 9 local time, uh, they're going to have uh, an event here, right? Uh, right here. Uh, uh, Yvonne Orji from um, uh, Insecure is going to be out here uh, as well. And some other entertainers are going to be out here. So if you're in L.A. or in the area, come on out. Be here from 6 to 9 p.m. Uh, and so I uh, look forward to having a great time. Don't forget, in a couple of hours, we'll be live streaming from the red carpet for the NAACP pre-show tomorrow uh, at uh, LA time uh, at uh, 5 p.m. local, 8 p.m. Eastern. We'll also be from the red carpet as well. So we look forward to you guys uh, joining us uh, this weekend. Don't forget to support Roland Martin Unfiltered by joining our Bring the Funk fan club. You can actually go to RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. It's a whole bunch of folks out there who claim to be black media, uh, but they don't show up at events like this. Uh, they just sit, sit behind a microphone and talk. That's not what we do. We actually go where the news is uh, all around this country, which is why we're here in Los Angeles. So go to RolandMartinUnfiltered.com uh, to join our Bring the Funk fan club. Uh, and so I got to go, folks. Uh, as you see, of course, uh, I am dressed as well for the pre-show. Uh, I had to go ahead and rock this. Uh, and the McDonald's folks thought I was wearing it for them. I'm like, well, but it, it worked. Okay, it goes, it goes with, goes with all the signage. And so, uh, thanks a bunch, folks. Uh, I will see you guys in a couple of hours. Uh, we're gonna look forward to having a great conversation. But you want to see this discussion with Erica Alexander, uh, and she laid it down. She laid it down, and you want to hear what she has to say. All right, folks, I gotta go. Holler.
You want to support Roller Barge Unfiltered? Be sure to join our Bring the Funk fan club. Every dollar that you give to us supports our daily digital show. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real as Roller Martin Unfiltered. Support the Roller Martin Unfiltered daily digital show by going to RollerMartinUnfiltered.com. Our goal is to get 20,000 of our fans contributing 50 bucks each for the whole year. You can Which check out Roller Martin Unfiltered. Roller youtube.com forward slash Roland S. Martin. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real. It's Roland Martin Unfiltered. See that name right there? Roland Martin Unfiltered. Like, share, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. That's youtube.com forward slash Roland S. Martin. And don't forget to turn on your notifications so when we go live, Hey fam, want to check out Roller Martin Unfiltered, the blackest show on all of digital cable and broadcast. Want to check out our audio podcast. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real. It's Roller Martin Unfiltered. Press play.